International and Economist for Future International are in conversation with the author Simon Sharp. Uh, we'll get to the kind of introducing the book and, and Simon in a second, but first of all, um, my name's Ross. I am a member of the Rethinking Economics International team, um, and it's great to be here with you today as co-host of this session. And uh, if Reeve, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, for sure. Um, my name is Reeve. I'm representing Economists for Future. Um, I'll do a little quick introduction for EFRF. Um, we are an international initiative aiming to mobilize econ economists, oh my goodness, um, and the influence they have to help arrest the planetary emergency. Uh, we do this, we're a small team that does this through targeted research, advocacy, um, with students, academics, and university departments. I think we'll have some links and stuff to get more involved in the chat, so keep out a lookout for that. Um, but yeah, it's nice to be here. Amazing, thank you, Reeve. Um, and yeah, today um, this uh, book launch and the discussion on this book can uh, come at a more apt time because you know, earlier this week we saw the publishing of the synthesis report for the from the IPCC, the UN body that kind of demonstrates the scale of the challenge that we've got on our hands if we're going to arrest the pace of climate collapse, climate chaos, climate change, whatever you want to call it, biodiversity loss, biodiversity collapse. Um, and uh, Simon's book, uh, Five Times Faster, discusses a lot of these questions. Um, and I'm not going to I'm not going to steal the talking points that, Sam, that Simon's then going to take um, when he begins his discussion, but really looks at kind of how on a number of fronts um, we need to pick up the speed at which we are making a transition to something new if we're going to make the the planet we live on hospitable for years to come um, and before we do that I'm going to hand you back over to Reed just to give a bit of a a, a potted history of Simon and, and kind of um yeah how, what's led up to this this call today. Simon is the director of a economics for the UNFCCC Climate Champions, a senior fellow at the World Resource Institute and was previously the deputy director of the UK government's COP26 unit, where he led international campaigns on energy, transport, land use, science and innovation. Um, also a strong supporter of rethinking economics. So thank you so much for being here. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Ruth. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Uh, good to be with you. Um, like we've said, I'm, I'm a big fan of rethinking economics um, and have had a contest with the group going back several years and really happy as well to know that Economists for Future is forming up and campaigning in a, in a focused way as well to bring new economic thinking to climate change. Um, as, as you will see, I think that's desperately needed. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about some of the ideas in my book that's coming out. Uh, I left government a year ago, partly so that I could speak and write more freely on these things. Um, now, make sure I can move my slides. This is the context that to meet the targets that we have of avoiding dangerous climate change, we have to decarbonize the global economy five times faster this decade than we did on average over the last two decades. That's in terms of reducing the emissions intensity of the global economy. That's an absolutely massive acceleration. And it's it seems hard to believe that we can do that. And we certainly can't do it if we keep on going about it the same way that we have done so far. We're going to have to change something significant. And the premise of my book is that not all the things that we have to change are the easily visible things. It's a bit like a city. You see the functioning things above ground, but the things that actually help it function, much of it depends on what's going on below ground where you can't see the infrastructure of the sewage pipes, the electricity wires, the, the gas pipelines, all of that. And I think there's something analogous in the way we have to address climate change, that it's not just about changing the visible infrastructure of the coal power stations and the petrol driven cars it's also about the invisible infrastructure of ideas and institutions those are the things that actually govern a lot of what goes on and those also need changing and of course 
my, my book is about the science, economics, and diplomacy of climate change. But in this talk, I'll just focus on the economics, which arguably needs the most fundamental changes of any of those three areas. And the starting point for this discussion is really the idea of equilibrium, uh, defined in economics as a situation in which nobody has any immediate reason to change their actions so that the status quo can continue at least temporarily. That idea, equilibrium, or that assumption has really been the foundation for the mainstream economics that we've had for, you know, that has been dominant, certainly in recent decades, and in some ways for the last 150 years or so. Now, I want to contrast that assumption, situation in which nobody has any immediate reason to change their actions, with the situation that we face with climate change, where the IPCC says meeting climate goals requires rapid and far-reaching system transitions unprecedented in terms of scale. Obviously quite different. And you put these next to each other, well, you could say that a system transition is a situation in which many actors have many reasons to change their actions so that the status quo is replaced with something completely different. That's about as far away from equilibrium as you can get. Now, this, this assumption of equilibrium, whether we stick to it or whether we depart from it, 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 it influences how we understand the economy itself, what we think it's like, whether we think it's like a machine, static, predictable, either functioning or failing, and if it fails, you fix it, or if we think of the economy as an ecosystem, which is constantly evolving, it's uncertain and unpredictable, and it neither functions nor fails, it just has practically unlimited possibilities. Those are two entirely different ways of thinking about the economy. I'd argue that for most purposes, the ecosystem way is much more appropriate. Uh, the economy, just look around us. You can see it is changing all of the time uh, over in, in many ways, in unpredictable ways. Uh, but particularly when you apply it to the problems of climate change, where structural change, innovation, creation of new solutions is absolutely essential to solving the problem. The other thing that happens um, if you are stuck with an assumption of equilibrium in the economy is that you're stuck thinking about problems of allocating existing resources. Resources are fixed, all you can do is allocate them differently. But if you don't think in equilibrium terms, then you can think much more freely about the creation and change of resources. Instead of allocative efficiency, you can also think in terms of dynamic efficiency how an economy emerges in the first place and how it grows and changes structurally over time. Brian Arthur, who's a, a well-known complexity eco economist, has written that actually these two problems have been present in economics since the very beginning, back two and a half thousand years ago in the ancient Greeks. They recognized these two different problems of economics. The, the problem of dynamic change, creation, formation has just been rather sidelined in the last 150 years because for some reason we got it into our heads that economics had to be about solving equations and that's much easier when you focus on allocation and not creation. Now this difference has I think really strong implications for policy. What I've said so far might sound theoretical but the reason I now spend all my time working on this is it really matters for policy. If you understand the economics wrong, you give the wrong advice to policy. And I'll say a few words about this in relation to each of the three main levers of policy. Most policy falls into one of these categories, either investment, spending money, tax, taking money away, or regulation, changing the rules of the game. And when you put those things together, then you also think about strategy. So first, investment. For a long time, we've been uh, told by economists that subsidies are likely to be inefficient. They're the second best way of doing things, uh, not nearly as good as a carbon price across the economy. But look what Stefan Halligat says, who's a senior economist in the World Bank and his colleague Julie Rosenberg. Today, renewable energy is cheaper than coal in many places in the world. 
car manufacturers working on electric cars, city switching to electric buses. All of this was achieved with policies focused on new investments, not with carbon taxes. And look what it has achieved, this graph on the left. What you're seeing here is the change of expectations over time, that back in 2005, experts thought that by 2020, we would have about 50 gigawatts of solar power globally. But it turns out when we actually got to 2020, we have more than 700 gigawatts of solar power globally, over 10 times as much. So we achieved vastly more than we expected, and we did it with a different policy instrument from the one that we expected. Why was that? Well, I think the answer is mainly to do with reinforcing feedbacks. And this is what you get when you grow a new technology and a new system. You get increasing returns to scale, not diminishing returns. You get learning by doing. The more we make something, the better we get at making it. The economies of scale, the more of it we make, the cheaper it gets. And the emergence of complementary technologies, the more a technology is used, the more other technologies get invented that make the first one more useful. And this macro feedback of investment, which drives innovation, which increases demand, which leads to further investment. These are three, four interacting, reinforcing feedbacks that all push each other around. And this is why you see that exponential growth rate in the new technology, uh, similar dramatic dropping costs happening at the same time. And what happens when you subsidize that technology or you regulate to direct support investment directly to it is you strengthen these reinforcing feedbacks. Whereas if you took the economist's advice and just priced carbon, you don't do this at all. All you're doing is gently pushing on the incumbent system or even pushing hard on the incumbent system, but you don't have any of these increasing returns to scale to help you. In fact, all you get is resistance and possibly the incumbent system functioning slightly more efficiently than it did before. That's not what is going to bring about system change in a cost-effective way. And of course, you can look back at the past and look at how technology transitions happened then. And an uh, economist called Frank Heels has done a lot of case studies of this, which are really worth reading if you're interested in this kind of thing. Uh, one of the most obvious ones to think about is the transition from horses to cars. And here, all kinds of people helped this transition happen, and they did it by investing in the new system. They invested in car engines, in factories, in motors. They built the highways. They wrote the highway code. They developed all of the systems that we know about to make sure that driving is safe and socially acceptable. Um, they didn't just do it by putting a tax on horseshit, even though horseshit was actually a, a serious problem in some cities back uh, just before cars arrived. So that was investment. The, the second policy lever to talk about is regulation. And often regulation is uh, talked about in very negative terms. It's inefficient, it's a burden, it's red tape, and the less of it, the better. I, I think that's obviously sometimes that's the case. You can have bad regulation, but there's no reason to think that regulation is inherently bad. And an example I give is traffic regulation. In all of our countries, we have a rule that says you drive on one side of the road, the left or, or the right, whichever country you're in. We don't just have a free for all. Nobody thinks that that regulation makes the system less efficient, makes it considerably more efficient. Uh, we'd all be stuck otherwise. So let's get rid of that assumption and instead think about what can regulation do in a, an, an evolving economy? This is a study that was done uh, by Stephen Chu and some colleagues. Stephen Chu was energy secretary to Barack Obama. And before that, he was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. And uh, he wrote many, many papers on physics this was the first one he published on economics. And he did it because he was finding life difficult in government. He really wanted to pass some tough efficiency standards for appliances, things like fridges and washing machines. And his problem 
was that the economists in his department kept saying that if he did this, it would push up the prices of those appliances. And he did this study to look at what had actually happened in the past when higher standards were introduced. And what he found was it did the opposite. It actually accelerated cost reduction, which was quite a, a surprising thing, uh, going uh, directly against the traditional expectations of economics. Now, a way I would explain that, um, I'll give two ways, but, but one way I, I think is a useful metaphor. You imagine the uh, flow of finance through part of the economy as the flow of a river. And without any kind of constraints in place, it's a broad and slow flow. Uh, it, it doesn't impart a great deal of energy. The finance can flow quite easily from the consumers through to the shareholders. What regulation can do, like this guy pulling a lever, is change that flow of finance and, in fact, force it to go down a narrow channel where it has to do more work. Work done is energy, of course, and innovation. And the, the product standards are like that. They say you can't just make any product in this sector. You have to meet a really high standard of energy efficiency. That's difficult to do. So it channels finance into that narrow space of solving that difficult problem, and that forces innovation. So you have to spend more money on R&D, for example, and less money just giving it back to your shareholders or advertising your existing product. Another way to think of this is in evolutionary terms, the less fit a population is for its environment, the faster it has to evolve. And a regulation is is like a change to the environment that suddenly makes all the products and the business plans less fit for their current environment. Uh, and that's what forces them to shift their resources from exploiting their position to exploring for a, a better strategy. So again, that's a way of understanding why it would force faster innovation. And a lot of the thinking about the economy as a complex system tends to use the maths of biology rather than as, as it did 150 years ago and got stuck with the maths of mechanical physics. Um, so now the third one we'll talk about tax. Uh, I've already said that investment uh, can often be a more effective way to bring about a technology transition than tax. But let's say we do want to use tax. How can we use it to be as useful as possible? Here again, I, I think the advice has often uh, sent people looking in the wrong direction. The advice has been that you should tax carbon at a level that reflects the social cost of carbon. In other words, how much damage is done by climate change for each ton of carbon that you emit. And on the left, this is a, a quote from a report of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, who said that they'd done some rigorous evaluation of costs and benefits and made some technical corrections that updated their estimate of the social cost of carbon from $36 per ton to $37 a ton. But to be honest, that, that was a meaningless estimate because at the same time, the scientists were saying, well, unless you have some kind of parameter representing willingness to pay to avoid human extinction, then social cost of carbon estimates can be unboundedly high. In other words, it's somewhere between naught and infinity, depending on how much you really care about things. So it's whatever number you want it to be. And that's not a very useful guide to policy. So I argue that actually the absolute price of carbon really doesn't matter. What matters is the relative price. And you have to think about it in terms of competing technologies and how you might use a tax to advantage one technology over another. And this is most likely to be useful if they're already quite close in terms of price or cost within a given sector. When they are, you might be able to use tax to cross a tipping point where one suddenly starts to outcompete the other. And then not only will it do that, but it will start to benefit from those reinforcing feedbacks I was talking about earlier. Now, we can actually see that tipping points like that have played a role in the fastest low carbon transitions so far. One of these examples is the UK in the power sector. It's the fastest power sector decarbonizing country in the world. 
And most of what we've done is quite similar to what all the other countries have done. Subsidize solar and wind, put some air pollution controls on coal, had an emissions trading scheme within the EU. All of that is, is quite typical. One thing we did that was unusual was have a fixed carbon tax in the power sector of about 18 pounds a ton. And it just happened, I really think more by luck than judgment, that that was just enough that it made coal more expensive than gas. And this was at a time when renewables were growing very fast, fossil fuels were competing over a smaller share of the market. And when coal was made more expensive than gas, coal really started to lose out very badly in the market and it became unprofitable and many of those coal power plants were closed down. That's what caused the extremely rapid drop in emissions in the UK power sector. And that was a very, very small intervention that achieved that. Second example is in road transport, where Norway is having by far the fastest transition in the world to electric vehicles. And they have many policies in place, uh, and all of them in combination are achieving this success. But their own electric vehicle agency says the main reason why their market is so successful compared to any other country is that they have this combination of tax and subsidy that makes an electric vehicle cheaper to buy at the point of purchase than the equivalent petrol or diesel car. So again, you've crossed a tipping point in consumer preferences, and that's getting them extremely fast progress. So um, historically, we've often uh, seen the outputs of economic models that suggested that the more you want to reduce emissions, the more it's going to cost. And in fact, those models suggest that this is the same year on year, that every year you're back to the beginning again. And if you want to achieve the same emissions reductions, you have to pay the same cost all over again. And it's a bit like the Greek myth of Sisyphus, where he's pushing the boulder up the hill, but it always rolls back down to where he started. When we think more realistically about how a transition works, we can think about it more as a hill that is not a never ending one, but one that has a summit. And if you work your way up with research and development, subsidies, regulation, infrastructure investment, eventually you get somewhere near the top. And at that point, a small tax that's just enough to cross the tipping point can send the boulder rolling down the other side of the hill. In other words, the transition beyond that point gains its own momentum and starts accelerating of its own accord. And you could say we're already seeing this happening now in the power sector globally and probably in road transport as well. Doesn't mean to say that it's all easy past that point. There's still bumps on the way down. It can still be difficult, but it doesn't get harder and harder and harder endlessly. In fact, it gets harder, but then it gets easier. So the last thing I want to say about tax is that the traditional recommendation to have a single equal carbon price across the whole economy is really not a helpful one at all. It's based on the idea of allocative efficiency, that you should find the emissions reductions wherever they can be found most cheaply, but it ignores the possibility that the economy changes over time, which we know that it does. So it's much more helpful to think in dynamic efficiency terms, what is the level of carbon pricing that helps bring about rapid change in each sector. And there, of course, is different in every sector. So if you happen to have the level that's just right to cross the tipping point in road transport, it will be woefully ineffective in steel, and it will be grossly inefficient in power and buildings, for example. So it's much better to have the right level of pricing in each sector, appropriate to what you're trying to achieve. Now, We've talked about these three levers of policy, and the last thing I want to cover is how they come together in strategy. And I mean, this is only one aspect. In, in fact, this, this picture here is about strategy, really, because if you want a transition, you have to follow the policy through all these different stages, use all of these different levers to get where you're trying to go. Um, but in another sense, it's important to think about the relationship between technologies and the economy itself. Um, often we're, we're told that policy ought to be technology neutral. And 
uh, perhaps if the economy was completely static, then that would be possible. But if you think of the economy and its collection of technologies as being like an ecosystem and its collection of inhabitants, then you realize that in fact, that's not possible, that anything you do in the ecosystem will advantage some of its inhabitants more than others. Neutrality is impossible. You will advantage some things more than others. The only choice you have is whether you do that consciously and deliberately or unconsciously and accidentally. And my example on the right here refers to the situation that came about in the UK, where we tried to design our uh, electricity market 10 years ago in a way that would bring forward clean technologies, but at the same time be technology neutral. And at every step of the way, we found out that wasn't possible. First of all, if we just tried to support any technologies, we'd just get the most mature ones, solar and wind onshore. Uh, then we split it so that it were funds for mature technologies and funds for less mature ones. And then we found out, actually, there's a big risk. We're about to give billions of pounds to burning wood. This is wood that's come from trees cut down in North America, shipped over the Atlantic in dirty boats, bunged in an old coal power station and burned. And not only is that probably not very good for emissions, not very good for air quality, but it seems unlikely that burning wood is going to be at the forefront of the economy of the 21st century, uh, creating lots of jobs and exports for the UK. Uh, but that's what was going to happen as a result of an attempt at being technology neutral and an accidental choice. And at that point, we sort of woke up and realized it would be much better if we chose deliberately and put some effort into on offshore wind instead, where there were much better potential for it to be a genuinely clean technology and for the costs to come down. And in fact, the costs have come down about 70% over the course of a decade. And offshore wind in the UK is now far cheaper than gas for generating electricity. Now, those technology choices matter even more than their immediate effects because of path dependence in the economy. Our options in future depend on what happened in the past. And this graph here is, is showing the weather, how the weather's path dependent. That's why you don't get weather forecasts more than five days ahead, because tiny differences right now change into large differences over the course of time. And the economy is the same. So our choices now really matter. And one way of thinking about this is, let's imagine the low carbon transition as a challenge of crossing a mountain range. Now, not only is the easiest next step not necessarily the easiest path through the mountains, but whichever path you take, it will take you to a different destination. You know, we could have chosen burning bio biomass because it was cheaper at one particular point in time, but the overall path would have been more difficult and we'd have been left in a different place with, with more biomass assets and less of an offshore wind industry than if we'd chosen the offshore wind path which was a bit more difficult at first, but significantly easier after that. And finally, this uh, matters so much because the economy, as, as Brian Arthur said, emerges from its technologies. The choices we make about technologies shape the economy itself. You think about way back when cars were first beginning to appear on the scene as a threat to horses, and people were experimenting back then with electric cars, steam-driven cars, and of course, petrol-driven cars. And at that early stage, it wasn't obvious at all which one was going to be the winner. It turned out to be petrol cars, and that drove, in many ways, the expansion of the, the oil industry itself, and, and many other things that have flown from that. So there's really, there's no such thing as an optimal path into the future economy, because the future economy doesn't yet exist. Uh, we have to discover it as we go along. The path is made by walking. And that's really all I'm gonna say so that we'll keep time for discussion. Uh, I'll just close with showing you, this is, this is the website I've created for my book where there's a bunch of sources and information and hopefully things you'll find that are helpful. So thank you very much. Look forward to discussion.
Amazing. Thank you very much, Simon. And as, as Sono's been saying in the chat, please do um, take a minute or so and just think about any questions or points you would like to make um, following Simon's really interesting presentation. But um, myself and Reeve are going to take facilitator's prerogative. And I think you've got a question, Reeve, that you wanted to, to, to get to kick mm -hmm. things off with. Yeah, um, we we have a question from Ifra, but firstly, we just want to thank you for putting this book together. Um, it addresses a lot of the questions that we've been asking ourselves um, in terms of just the like visible failures of the field of economics as it's pertaining to the climate crisis. And I really feel like it parsed out everything in a really clear like order. Um, so thank you and congratulations like on the book launch. <laughs> um, yeah, but so our question that we have now just to kind of kick off the Q&A portion. Um, let me just find it in my notes. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're wondering what your thoughts and assessments are when it comes to diplomacy kind of failing to address equity when it comes to the differentiated responsibilities in addressing climate change, especially as it comes to the disproportionate impacts of climate change on marginalized and vulnerable communities. And if there are any ways you see diplomacy improving or changing so that it can address disproportionate impacts um, and just kind of how you see what it's doing now that you see that works or what you hope to see in the future. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, look, first of all, thanks thanks for your first comments, Reeve. And everything I've written is massively building on loads of other people's work, uh, which is always true. But I have to say, people like Eric Beinhocker wrote a brilliant book, Origin of Wealth, um and you know brian arthur who i mentioned several times and had so many people doing amazing stuff that it's to me it's it's inspirational how many people are thinking about how economics needs to change um so the diplomacy um that's that's a whole other section of the book, and I could have given a whole other talk on that. But there's a strong link between the economics and the diplomacy, which is that when we think in allocative terms, uh, as we have been doing in the economics, then it implies a certain kind of diplomacy. If you think the world economy is fixed and static, technologies don't change, interests don't change, then it suggests that the right way to solve this problem diplomatically is that you measure the global carbon budget and then you try and agree how to divide it up that's a allocative efficiency problem and so that's what people tried to do in many ways we've had 30 years of diplomacy trying to do that um what i argue in the book is that that is more or less the worst possible way of trying to solve the problem uh it's the approach of least leverage because it's got all the countries in the world trying to agree something so the lowest possible lowest common denominator uh, and it's setting the scope of the problem at its maximum all the emissions in the whole economy all at once over the long term which is a bit like saying why don't we get all of the countries in the world to sit down and try and negotiate an agreement for world peace and actually that has been tried before it was something called the kellogg Briand pact back in about 1925 or 1928 i forget which and they actually did this and they came up with this great agreement that they were never going to have a war again. And then, you know, not long later, you know what happened. And that didn't work because it drew the boundaries of the problem far too broadly. If you want to solve any problem in diplomacy, you have to break it down to a manageable scale. And you really need the fewest possible numbers of countries working together uh, to try and solve it. So um, I think diplomacy can be much more effective than it currently is and the way it can do that is by focusing on each of the emitting sectors separately uh, and doing the same on problems of resilience where they're, they're you know cross-border aspects which many of them do um, negotiating in small groups in each of those sectors and focusing not on long-term targets where nobody has any confidence in what they can achieve but focusing on current actions what are we actually going to do now that's so powerful because when you do the right thing now 
it changes the context and it makes it easier to do something else again later that turns out to be stronger. It's like that graph I showed earlier of, of the solar power increase. Nobody, if you'd sat down in 2005 and said, let's all agree that we're going to have 700 gigawatts of solar power in 2020, not one single government in the world would have said, yeah, we can commit to our part of that. But it happened because of some actions that took place that changed the conditions for further actions. So, sorry, this is a long answer, but it was a good question. And, and the bit you started with, I haven't come to yet, and that's the equity part. I think it's incredibly hard. Um, I think all of us recognize that climate change is deeply unfair and that the countries that have done the least to cause it are suffering the most. Um, can we bring about a situation where the countries that have caused it the most are giving much more money to the ones that are suffering the most? I honestly don't know. I mean, look at international aid, the overall volumes, you know, forget climate change just generally, are they going up or down? Or look at countries' attitude to migration. Is it becoming more open or less open? I think it's hard to detect a, a big shift uh, in those things over time, one way or the other. Um, so I on on that particular aspect of it, the equity aspect, I, I find it hard to see strong reasons to be optimistic. But on can we work together to reduce emissions much faster and therefore limit the threat to everybody? Yes, I think we absolutely can, and we should do that. Thank you. Um, I think now we'll take questions from the chat. I think we have a few queued up. Um, so if Ross, you want to start doing yeah. that. The way we did this this morning, so this is actually the, the second session um, of, that we've done of this today. The way we did it this morning was that, um, to save uh, the only three voices you hear being mine, Simon's, and Reeves, we let people kind of come up to the stage and, and ask the question themselves. Um, if you wouldn't like to do that, feel free just to say in the chat when, when I invite you up um, or to, if people can write in the chat. Um, but I think it was nice to kind of, the, to hear the question from the, the person that posed it. So um, maybe we'll start with, um, Guy, you put one of the first questions about the IPCC report. Um, so I can, I'll just, give you the ability uh, to come up uh, and yeah, to ask the question. You should be able to unmute yourself now, G Gary. All right, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Mm. Okay, that's great. Simon, thank you. I'm looking forward to reading the, the book as well. Um, yeah, I just was curious, question I asked was this week, the, the big report dropped, the IPCC report, and a few headlines, uh, maybe many headlines in that first day, but afterwards it feels like everyone returns to business as usual uh, very quickly and there's not the sort of <clears throat> immediate action or continued focus that uh, maybe we need given the crisis level that is being faced. As you thought about your, put pulled this book together, I wondered, <clears throat> you know, how do, how does the world move faster to address these these core crisis issues that are everywhere at the same time? Uh, what has to happen for this incrementalist kind of approach to stop where you've got companies and governments wanting to do little bits and little bits not to disrupt things very much and you know set targets that are 20 years, 30, 50 years down the road, et cetera. So that, that's my that's my question for you today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, yeah, in a way, the, the the whole book is an attempt to answer that question. How how could we possibly go so much faster as as we apparently need to do? And I I started it by saying that there are some common answers to this that I've never found satisfactory, and one of them is well, all we need is more political will. And, uh, you know, we've got all of the solutions, everything's there, you know, for goodness sake, why don't governments just want it more and try harder? And I've always found that one unsatisfying because what makes us think that we're going to have a different quality of political leader now or in future from the ones that we've had so far? Um, 
And and the other one you often hear is, well, you know, maybe it's going to be bottom up behavior change from society. Usually, whenever someone says that, they say something about there being lots of lots more young people in Europe deciding to be vegans, uh, which, you know, again, that's a good thing. But there are lots of people in China who are not deciding to be vegans. And, you know, I find it unconvincing that system change in huge chunks of the global economy can be entirely brought about by, you know, individuals deciding to recycle their coffee cups. And so what I'm getting at in the book is ways that we can change things structurally that can enable much faster change, but don't require you to believe in something that stretches plausibility. Like we don't all have to be better people and we don't have to have the enormous luck of getting a much better set of political leaders across the world than we've normally had. Um, and so in a way, it's surprising how some of these things that seem quite technical and incremental can have a huge impact. So I gave the example of the UK power sector decarbonization. That has been over the last decade or so, roughly eight times faster than the global average. So that's the kind of acceleration we need. And I think you can look at any sector, look at the difference between the country that's furthest ahead and moving the fastest and the average, and you'll see that kind of difference. So I think there's there's really serious acceleration that is possible if we understand how to how to find the points of leverage in a complex system, how to change things structurally quickly. And I you know, absolutely think we can do that. In some ways, this kind of knowledge has been around for 50 years, but it's been on the margins. It's not been in economics and it's not been applied to public policy and it's not been applied to low carbon transitions, but it's not too late. Amazing, a really good question that allows you to say, buy the book to fully understand this question. Uh, of course, I'll say that to all the questions. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, the next question on the list was from um, Patrick. So I'm going to give Patrick, if you're still here, the opportunity to come up to the stage. Uh, yeah, one second. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. We can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, Simon, thank you for your presentation. Uh, and thanks for writing this book. Uh, and I, I very much applaud like, the spirit of going five times faster. Uh, it is especially, um, you know, moving coming from you, someone who's been on the inside of many of these conversations this can be here about from the outside. Uh, however, I, I hear your presentation and it, it seems to me that you're equating efficiency with effectiveness in a lot of these cases. Like when you're talking about taxes, uh, it, I heard you say that we can tax just to the correct tipping point uh, and that we should have a different social cost of carbon for every industry. But if we really need to move five times faster, and as the IPCC has said, we need an unprecedented systems change, it seems to me that this is an unprecedented enough intervention to, uh, I don't know, to meet the goal. So given the, the stakes, like you said, the, the, the parameter of avoiding human extinction, uh, why not just, ban new production of you know fossil fuel emitting cars uh, and if the answer is a lack of political will that that seems to run counter to what you said in the last question so uh and i guess beyond that i wonder what you think of um uh andreas malm's argument about tipping points in the uh you know global fossil fuel in infrastructure if you're familiar with that uh but again thanks for your presentation i'll you know, listen to your response thanks patrick that, that's a that's a great question. Um, the second part of it, I didn't understand. So let me answer the first part. And then if you like, come back and, and ask me the second part and, and just explain that reference that you made. Um, so no, really great point. And, and you're absolutely right. Um, I agree. Uh, my point on tax was that if you're going to use tax, what is an effective way to use it? And really, the, the crucial point was, think about relative value, not absolute value. And if you get that right, sometimes it can really help you. But, and and by the way, it, it varies by sector, uh, what, what the most 
appropriate approach it's going to be and it also varies by the state of the transition but i think the the gist of what you were saying i agree with 100 percent that in many cases regulatory standards and mandates are going to be the best thing to do and the the car industry is a great example of this by far the most effective policy at the moment is a zero emission vehicle mandate and it's often talked about as a ban but of course it's only a ban when you get to the end of it, when you get to 100% and you say every car you sell has to be zero emission. But it's a progressive thing. It, it starts wherever you want to start, at naught or at 10%, and it goes on a trajectory, however you set that trajectory. And I, at the moment, there's good reason to think that that is by far the most effective policy in the road transport transition. Uh, there are very few places using it, but the ones that are uh, doing extremely well. California, where the EV market share is about four times higher than the US as a whole. China, which was, you know, has been one of the leading countries in that transition. Uh, two provinces in Canada, which are massively outperforming the rest of the country. And the reason it's so effective is the industry really wants to hold back and uh, carry on doing what it does, making high profits on petrol cars, building them bigger and bigger and bigger and advertising to tell us that we should really buy the biggest ones we can. And they don't want to do EVs. And the ZEV mandate forces them to supply EVs to the market and they can't hide behind the argument that uh, people don't want to buy them. And so, yeah, it takes some political guts to put that through, but not necessarily more than a tax. And that actually, when you model this in a disequilibrium model, which I have done with some colleagues, then it shows that the ZEV mandate gets the cost of the electric vehicles down faster than any other policy. And it's it's by far the most cost-effective thing that you can do, it tends to get you the most positive economic outcomes on just about all measures. Uh, probably good for competitiveness as well, because it forces the car industry in your country to move swiftly to investing in the new technologies instead of getting hung up on the old ones. So. I, well, that's a long way of agreeing with everything you said. Um, do you want to do you want to just bring back that second question you had? Uh, well, I can I can maybe do it at the end if there's time. I see there's a few other questions. I, okay. I'd rather hear those answered than mine. Thanks for your okay. answer. Cheers. There was actually a, a Eben. Are you still in the session? Because I think if you need to leave, maybe you can ask your question. Are you you next to the list? Will you just check? Ah, there we go. You know ability to to talk, Evan, if you're still with us. Yes, uh, thank you. My question is um, about uh, your consideration of Jevons paradox. My concern is this uh, this adhesion to the market as the only way, the focus on provisioning our way into uh, whatever a, a, a sustainable economy, which I'm not convinced is going to happen. Um, and this is because of Jevons paradox, right? We have, I have attached a, a link to a Nature article that has the provocative title, Scientists, plural, Scientists Warning on Affluence, that pretty clearly demonstrates that it is the consumptive appetites of the wealthy in the world that are driving all of the ecosystem collapse problems that we have, including climate change. And those appetites are insatiable. So as long as we have this idea that it's going to be substituting, you know, having jobs and having cars and having all of these things, um, I see that appetite for more and more stuff occupying any space that we can take in having substitute or sustainable technologies that sustain them. And that's what this Nature article demonstrates. So I wonder if you can speak to Jevons' paradox in that way. Yeah. Would, it be, would you be able to just explain uh, Jevon, Jevons, Jevonson's paradox, Simon, just for people not maybe aware of it in the webinar? Sure. And, and thanks, Evan. Uh, I think that's it's a really well put question and quite a deep one. Um, but Jevons' paradox, I, I think, was first put um, in relation to coal, where he said uh, that, that we could increase the efficiency of ways that we use coal. Uh, but if we did that, that would contribute to pushing down its costs and encourage us to consume more of it so actually becoming more efficient would increase our consumption overall so we might think that we get consumption down but it would actually carry on going up it's 
it's a kind of balancing feedback. Um, now, I think in a way, if, if we're defining the problem as eliminating emissions, then there are ways to not be stuck in Jevons paradox. I think if, if our approach was, for example, carbon pricing, uh, then often all it does is force the fossil fuel economy to function slightly more efficiently, which may just reduce the price of fossil fuels and encourage more consumption, it, it, exactly what you're getting at. But if in the different kind of example I was just giving, um, let's say that within a given sector, you have a mandate that forces uh, the product or, or the production process to become zero emission by a given point in time, then Jevons paradox can't really get you there because it's not about efficiency. It's about structural change, moving to something that is zero emissions. Um, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that is, you know, in, in that sense, I think you can avoid Jevons paradox. But I think there's a, a broader issue you're getting at, which is if you don't limit the problem to emissions, you don't limit it just to climate change, and you're instead thinking about all of the different ways in which the expanding human footprint causes destruction on the planet, then the question is, is there any way to limit that? Or is every kind of growth necessarily destructive? Um, a, a big part of my answer is, I don't know. But another part of my answer is, I think the growth debate um, is often held on slightly the wrong terms. As in, traditionally, of course, in neoclassical economics, we measure growth as a, an amount of activity. And often that's closely linked to material of through flow in the economy. And if that's how we think of growth, then it's not surprising that a lot of people would say, well, we're on a finite planet. That kind of growth is always going to be destructive. There are points where one way or another, we're going to be limited. But there is a different way of thinking about growth, which is uh, qualitative rather than quantitative. And Eric Beinhocker describes this as growth of solutions. Like actually, we don't really care about the level of activity in the economy. We don't really care about the quantity of material through flow. We really care about how many solutions do we have to human problems? What's the diversity and what's the availability of those solutions? And I think in those terms, qualitative growth may be possible and there may not be any intrinsic limits on that. Uh, but I don't know. And I think I'm just as worried as you are in what you said about the risk that we do continue to be deeply self-damaging. Thanks very much for that question. If, uh, if anyone is in Copenhagen at the end of the month, that we're rethinking economics in Denmark is hosting a big conference kind of on this question, questions of growth, but kind of measurements the limitations of GDP and also kind of what a new measurement might be, whether it's solutions focused growth, I'm not sure, but um, thanks very much for that, Simon. Um, now, I think uh, Chiel, who had asked a question, is has is, um, had to leave the session. But um, Karen, if you'd like to come to the stage and ask your question, and this will probably be the final question, but yeah, Karen, over to you. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Nice. Um, thank you, Simon, and all the organizers for this great event. My question is about the role of um, nuclear energy in those transition, uh, energy transition plan, and how, yeah, what can be the impact if implemented? or if it's considered as key. Mm. Thanks, Karen. Um, role of nuclear in the transition. Uh, so lots of people take a really strong position on this one way or the other. Um, I don't because I find it difficult and there are strong arguments in different directions. Um, I'll just mention a few of the things that I think are interesting. So of course, often the argument is about the risks of nuclear and its environmental 
or its health risks. Um, I think, you know, everybody knows that argument. That's that's well trodden. A, a couple of the things that are maybe not so much discussed as they could be. One is cost trajectories. Um, the cost of nuclear hasn't really come down over time, whereas the cost of renewables are coming down on exponential curves. Um, you know, they're coming down reliably and quickly. And in the UK, uh, we had an interesting turnaround because there was a time when we had a, a group called the Offshore Wind Industry Council, all the big offshore wind companies and the government, and they used to meet and say, how can we get costs down? What do we need to do? And at one stage, they had a target, which is let's make offshore wind as cheap as nuclear power. And sometime, I don't know, maybe 10 years later, maybe less, things had turned around and the Nuclear Industry Council was having meetings saying, how can we make nuclear as cheap as offshore wind? And I'm quite sure they never will. Offshore wind is still coming down in cost. Nuclear still isn't. So that's one thing. Another thing is there are countries like China, uh, Poland is another one, maybe parts of the US, where um, there are huge amounts of coal power and it's used not just for electricity, but also for generating heat. And if you're going to take away those coal power stations, you have to figure out where on earth is all that heat going to come from to heat people's homes. Uh, and there are people who are looking at the possibility of repurposing some of those old coal plants with uh, nuclear, uh, you know, nuclear reactors. Um, not everyone will like that idea, but if we're really trying to think about how do we attack the 2000 gigawatts of coal power stations that are in the world that need to be got rid of really quickly, then you could argue we need all of the options on the table. So I don't know if, if that's a good one, but I, I do think it's worth investigating seriously. Thanks very much. And that unfortunately brings us to the end of the QA and discussion session. But I've got I've got two questions before we go. One for Simon, one for Reeve. Simon, um where can people find this book? Where can they get their hands on it? Where can they continue um yeah, working at how we can make things move five times faster towards a decarbonized future? Thanks, Ross. Well, um, yep, the, the book is available. It's I think it's in the shops on the 6th of April, but it's already available online. And, and people I know have told me they ordered it and it's already turned up at their house. So it's there. Uh, so if you like the sound of it, please do get yourself one. Um, and also, I mentioned the website. It's fivetimesfaster.org. I put lots of materials on there, uh, which are all freely downloadable and shareable. Uh, so if you find any of this helpful, please, you know, pass it on to anybody else. Uh, we're all part of the same campaign. And uh, yeah, just uh, thank you guys for everything you do and keep campaigning. Thank you, Simon. And Reeve, in that spirit of keeping campaigning, if people want to learn more about Economists for Future and potentially get involved in your work, how can they go about doing that? Yeah. Um... We are excited to have more people get involved. Um, we have, we're on all of like the social medias. I think um, we're going to put in the chat some links so you can find, yes, okay. It's in the chat now. So it's a link to our Instagram, our Twitter, our LinkedIn, our Facebook, everything. Um, and if you'd like to get more involved directly, you can email um, info at econforfuture.org and that the four is a four. The number four, not ever. Um, so you can email that to stay updated. Um, subscribe to our newsletter. It'll all be on our social media. So if you follow any of those pages, you'll be able to stay up to date. Um, but yeah, we're excited to get and expand our reach and have more people involved. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to everyone that came today. Thanks for all the amazing questions. But most of all, thanks to Simon for coming along and for all the work you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye.